Okay, we're live to tape. So good morning again to everyone. I hope that you're all well today. And welcome to our Monday morning plenary this Thanksgiving week. Just a, a housekeeping announcement before we get started today. Um, we do have a holiday. It's a major holiday, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, in the US at least. And many people will be traveling and so forth, uh, Wednesday and Thursday and uh, onward. I will not be. I'm, I'm going to uh, remain at home. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, because of the uh, academic calendar, I know that <clears throat> some of you will have your breakout classes perhaps as early as tomorrow or indeed Wednesday. And those classes will uh, carry on as scheduled. But I think that Thursdays, Friday, Saturday's classes uh, will be cancelled owing to the Thanksgiving holiday. So, I mean, on the one hand, you're fully entitled to take the uh, holiday, and and that's fine. There's no penalty, obviously, for doing so. But because of our very unusual format this year of a Monday plenary, uh, which is also available for asynchronous viewing, and then I'm slated to meet with my breakout group of no fewer than 80 students in Section M on Thursday, which uh, will, will not be held uh, officially. Um, I think that it will turn out to be unfair this week uh, because I still plan to cover the same amount of material uh, that I would normally cover in two lectures. I mean, that's what the course mandates. Uh, but on the other hand, you're entitled to a holiday. So my proposal is um, for my group, at least, and for the benefit of others to whom this is applicable, uh, we're going to cover what we can cover this morning in our normal session. I'm not going to rush, uh, but I'll just move at my normal pace. And I'm going to record a lecture on Thursday at our appointed time uh, for Section M. That would be 11 a.m. Thursday to 12.15. Uh, holiday or not, I'm here, uh, and I'm happy to do it. So I will finish covering the prisoner's dilemma this week on Thursday. You're not obliged to, to attend that lecture on Thursday morning, but once again, it will be recorded and uploaded uh, so that uh, those who, who want to see it uh, will be able to see it at their convenience prior to next week where we take up a slightly different topic. So is that clear to everyone? Have I been clear so far about my intentions? Regarding this housekeeping, yes, everyone's saying yes, okay, because I know that some of you are watching the, the Thursday, some of you are attending my Thursday lectures, those in my group who have access to them on, on Blackboard at the uh, normal time, but because I also upload them to YouTube, I know that others may indeed want to watch them uh, as, as a, a compliment. Uh, to uh, your own instructors who I gather are doing a fine job. So uh, either way, uh, you get a different voice, and, and that's a good thing in philosophy. All right, so I'm going to treat this week as a normal week. Uh, you're not, and if there's nobody in, in the room on Thursday morning, um, I'm still going to give the lecture, and I'll upload it. Uh, when it's available to upload, and that way those of you will be able, you know, who, who want to see it will be able to see it. Uh, when you get back from your Thanksgiving break or at a time uh, asynchronously uh, uh, of your choosing. So, all right. I think, are there any questions about that plan? Is everyone clear? I'm going to, yes, I, I'm not, Ahmad, I can't repeat everything I've just said. Yes, I'm giving the normal lecture on Thursday. You're not obliged to be there because it's Thanksgiving holiday, but we have to. Um, well, you just walked in, but it's 9.34, and class starts at 9.30. That's why I start at 9.30, okay? Um, so I'm just saying to you and to everyone uh, that I'm giving the lecture uh, on Thursday at, uh, as scheduled at 11 o'clock. You don't have to be there um, uh, because it's Thanksgiving holiday, but I'm going to give it because I'm responsible for covering the material, and I'm not going to get through all of it today. Um, so I'm going to cover it on Thursday, and then you may watch the lecture at a time of your choosing because it will be available asynchronously. Okay, are we clear? All right, is everyone happy with that arrangement? <clears throat> you get the intention is uh, for you to have the best of both worlds. You can take your your day off Thursday. I'm talking to my group, right? But also the groups that meet Friday or or Saturday. Uh, you're you know you're you're not going to have. Uh, your normally scheduled lecture either. Um, so this way you'll be able to get the second half of what we begin to cover today. Is that all right? 
Okay, fine. Well, uh, you're welcome. I mean, I, I it's you, you could say it's nice, and um, I mean, I'm doing it because I feel a certain responsibility. And uh, well, okay, if Wednesday is running a Friday schedule, Kale, then you'll get, you know, <laughs> then then you. I don't know what that means for your breakout groups. Um, and again, that's likely to disrupt some of you. Um, so, so I mean, I can't speak to that, but I'm, I'm just going to make sure minimally that at least you get both segments from me. And I know that in two lectures, I can cover everything that we need to cover this week, whereas in one lecture alone, we would be too rushed and I wouldn't get through it all. Uh, so this way, even though you may have your own schedules disrupted and maybe happily so by Thanksgiving, I still want to make sure that both lectures are available to you uh, at a time of your choosing, at least. And that will also apply to uh, however many students are not in the room today. They'll find out about this when they elect to watch the upload on, on YouTube later today. All right. In any case, I'm done with the housekeeping. So let's now move on to the substance. And I think this week, uh, as well as next week should be very interesting for you as we're going to discuss an uh, extremely well-known model as well as a spin-off next week from that model. But on the agenda this week, and I'll just type it in, and I want to ask how many of you have heard of uh, The Prisoner's Dilemma? It's called The Prisoners. You've heard of it? Uh, somebody already saying you have? Okay, great. I'm glad you have. Oh, many of you have. I don't even have to type it in. I'm not typing any better this morning than I normally do. Um, but in any case, I'm going to type it in for the benefit of those who haven't. Uh, the Prisoner's Dilemma. Now, uh, you got it in economics. Yes, Kale, that would be a very uh, a popular uh, venue because it's a model that has many economic applications. So economists discuss it and research it. In, in its various forms. And also you might have heard about it in, in social psychology. And have you heard about it in a psychology class? Um, aside from economics, uh, psychologists study it, very popular. Uh, yes, Hillary in psych, you heard about it in psych. Um, and you may also uh, hear about it in mathematics uh, or indeed in computing. Uh, that is to say, AI, uh, there are computer tournaments that play this, this uh, model as, as a game. Um, there are uh, applications in evolutionary biology, which were only discovered in the 1980s. The model itself dates back to the late 1940s, early 50s. And there are also uh, many applications in philosophy itself as, uh, in terms of rational choice, because it's really a dilemma about rational choice. And we in philosophy have a obviously some interest in that. As well, rational choice overlaps with something more formal called decision theory, which is really more mathematically oriented and is also a synonym at times for something called game theory, which is a branch of mathematics created by von Neumann and Morgenstern in the late 40s. And that's an entirely new branch of mathematics that deals with attempting to model uh, decision-making in situations of risk or conflict of interest. And so this model is situated uh, in, the, in the crosshairs of, of quite a few different fields, each of whom finds it very interesting. So we're going to look more deeply at it from a philosophical point of view, naturally. Uh, but since some of you have already heard of it, uh, that will be helpful to you. But I'm going to begin from the beginning. I'm going to assume that no one has really heard of it. And even if you have, uh, it's possible if not likely, that my treatment of it will be a little bit deeper uh, than maybe not in the, the ones you've heard about in economics. Those models are quite mathematical for the most part. But uh, nonetheless, my treatment is going to be from initially from rational choice uh, perspective, and that, that therefore will be new to some of you. Is this part of game theory? Yes, Ahmed, I've just said this, that, um, that it, it's not formerly part of game theory, but it emerged exactly at the same time as game theory. And so initially it was mathematicians, game theory is a branch of mathematics, but game theory also has non-mathematical uh, uh, analogs such as rational choice theory, which may or may not use math. We're only gonna use uh, at the most in this model, <clears throat> my treatment of it, we're only gonna use high school algebra. 
So once again, if you have high school algebra, you'll get everything I'm going to say. If you don't have high school algebra, if you've managed to dodge that, uh, some of you may have, uh, well, then you may not get the algebra, but you're still going to get conceptually what the issue is. So I wouldn't worry too much. And a dilemma, you may know, uh, is not a paradox, right? Um, a dilemma is, uh, uh, if we're in a, in a dilemma, it means that we have basically two choices to make, and we're not sure which one is better. I mean, classically, dilemma means two what you have to make one of two possible choices, but it's going to be unclear to you which choice, or you know already that either choice could be advantageous or disadvantageous. There's no obvious choice that's that's preferable or, or, or better on any measure. And so the dilemma is how do you choose? And, and if you have rational choice theory at your disposal, you will also have, as we will see, principles of choice. And then how you resolve the dilemma is by deciding not what you're going to do necessarily, but which principle of choice is going to be more robust uh, or more persuasive to you as a means of guidance. So that, that is uh, our initial approach. And I'm going to show you lots of slides <clears throat> in a few moments to illustrate this. But the first thing I want to do before we get to the slides is just to categorize or characterize rather what is a prisoner's dilemma. For those of you who've never heard of it, and even for those of you who have, if you've watched any cop shows on TV, uh, then you'll have seen it. So let me ask this to the whole class. What's the first thing that happens if the police, and I'm not saying now whether um, they're, they're detaining people justly or unjustly, it has nothing to do with justice. I'm just saying for the sake of argument that the police arrest a pair of suspects who know each other, and in fact may well have been uh, accomplices in a crime, or maybe not, but the police have reason to arrest them. And so they, they take two suspects into custody, and these two suspects know each other. They may, in fact, have been taken into custody at the same time. So what's the first thing that the police do when they have these two suspects in custody? What's the first thing they do? Anybody? Separate them. Exactly. Okay. I don't know if you're speaking from personal experience or from watching TV. I hope the latter, but that's exactly right. That's exactly right. They separate them. And and what are they and why do they do that? Why do they separate them? Yes, anybody? Why? So that they would not. That's right. So they can't. So they play them. You guys are on the ball. Exactly. So they can play them against each other. Exactly right. And again, this is a standard strategy. So each one doesn't know what the other one is telling the cops. Right. And so what they do. So they cannot collude. Exactly. As uh, uh, as as one of you was saying, so they get to talk to each other. So they can't concoct a story and stick to it. And neither of them knows what the other one is, is going to say. So what do the cops typically do is that they will often go to prisoner A and say, you know what, your, your buddy just ratted on you, right? Your buddy just implicated you and is testifying against you, is giving evidence against you. So if you don't talk, if you don't give evidence against him, you're going to be the one who's holding the bag, right? He's going to be an, a witness and you're going to be accused. So they tell both of them the same story, hoping what? Hoping they both give evidence against each other. And Aisha is saying this, this always happens in law and order. Yeah. I, I mean, this happens in all cop shows sooner or later when they take two people. This is a, happens all over the world. It's very standard. So you understand that now. So that's the prisoner's dilemma in, in that literal scenario. It's really an allegory. It has much more application than that. But that's like, Plato's cave. It's kind of allegory to explain something that's actually deeper. So uh, if uh, think of it, you're prisoner, you're prisoner A, and you don't know what prisoner B is doing. You can't talk to prisoner B. If you both kept your mouth shut, actually, they would have to let you go. In the, in the classic dilemma, if you both shut up and you refuse to talk to them, then neither one can give, neither one's giving evidence against the other, and they don't have enough evidence, and actually they would let you go. But what they try and make you do is worry that the other one has already given evidence against you. So in which case, your best bet, you would think, is to give evidence against the other person. Uh, and then they're, they're both going to you're going to they're going to get both of you. But it's going to be lesser penalty because if you're giving evidence against each other, the evidence is less credible. Right. I mean, if you're both accusing each other, then that's much less credible. But if one of you keeps quiet, that's called cooperation, by the way, cooperating, meaning cooperating with your 
fellow prisoner, not with the authorities. If one of you keeps quiet and the other one gives evidence evidence against you, then you get the worst. You're you're getting the worst outcome, and the other one's getting the best outcome. Is this clear? Just in the terms of the storyline, does everybody get this? Sure. Okay. It, it, this is not difficult. And yeah, some of them are bound by code of silence, uh, Ahmad, unless they unless they really fear, uh, you know, that there's enough evidence against them. But usually, in, and in the history of the New York City's prosecution of the mafia, uh, of the five families, they busted all of them. And they did it because they, they basically got some very senior people to give evidence against their superiors, against the heads of the families, because they were led to believe that the heads of the families were actually going to make them uh, hold the bag, as it were, make them look as if they were responsible for everything. So if they can get you, if they can play on your mistrust of each other, uh, then they can certainly get everybody. Whereas if it's very hard in, in isolation to know what's going on, and so you may well fear that the other one's giving evidence against you, in which case your only resort really was, would be to give evidence against the other one. And so that's the dilemma, right? When you're one of these two prisoners and you're taken into custody and separated, the real question is, do you cooperate, meaning you shut up and not give evidence against your fellow prisoner, or do you defect in the language of the model? And if you defect, then you do talk, but if the other one talks, then they've got you both. Okay, so that's the basic setup of the dilemma, um, and and I think that's very clear. Certainly, to any of you who watch Law and Order or any of these other cop shows, that they, they all do this, but they also do it in real life. So these shows are in fact mimicking reality. Um, and uh, let's now go to the actual slideshow. Uh, there's quite a bit more going on in this model, but I'm going to share the screen with you. Now we're going to start to get into it in more depth. So just bear with me uh, while I share the screen. Looks like uh, Zoom is cooperating this morning. So um, you all see this, yeah? And we're looking now um, at um, the first slide. Uh, now the prisoner's dilemma classically uh, can be played with uh, two people. You could actually play one with one person against the state of nature, that's next week. Uh, but for our purposes this week, uh, it's really a minimum of two people, or it could be N people. In fact, what gets really interesting is when you end up with an N person, where N could be very large number of players. It could be a whole society ends up in a dilemma like this. We'll look at some examples. If not today, then certainly on Thursday, in my recorded lecture Thursday, uh, I'm going to treat the N player dilemma, which gives rise to some very poignant scenarios that affect all of us today. But we start in the simplest case, which is the two player. But just be mindful that the minimum number is two, and it can become as many people as you like. Also, the other possibility is that it could be one shot or iterated. One shot means that you're in the dilemma one time. You make your decision whether to cooperate or defect. The other prisoner does the same. And then, you know, you get the payoff or whatever the consequences are. Uh, they immediately are visited upon you. And that's the end of the game or the end of the scenario. It's also possible to iterate this, meaning to play it a number of times in succession as a game or indeed as a real life scenario. And then the conditions change because as the game goes on uh, with more and more iterations, you may learn what, what previously happened and then you may change your strategy as a result of that. This happens in computer generated tournaments where the players are actually programs. In other words, strategies which learn from past history of the game and may modify their behavior in light of that. So uh, is everyone clear about this? So you have a prisoner's dilemma with either two or many players, and it can either be a one-shot case or it could be iterated. In other words, played several times in succession. Is that fair enough? Are you all with me? Okay, thank you. Uh, if you do have questions at any time, you know, I'll just type them in, speak or type them into the chat room. I'm watching the chat room as we go. So I just will reiterate that the Prisoner's Dilemma, PD for short, has many applications, in, in, including mathematics. It can be studied in pure math or applied math. It has philosophical applications. We're looking at those today. Theology, surprisingly, we'll see on 
Thursday's lecture. Political science, definitely. Economics, very much so. Psychology all over the map and a lot of, a lot of social psychology and other, uh, other areas of psychology study this. Biology, surprisingly, which emerged in the 1980s, and also computer science, AI, and gaming. So what we see is it's a very rich model, right? A model is a, a kind of a, um, a simplification of a more complex scenario, which captures essential features of it, just like scale models. If you've ever built model cars or model planes or, or model trains, people have train sets sometimes, or they used to in their basements. These are models, they're not the real thing, but they nonetheless capture certain salient or essential features of the real thing. They model them, in other words. Yeah, they, they imitate them in some significant way. And so the prison's dilemma turns out to be a model, which has many kinds of applications. All right, we continue now. And here is a layout. I'm now showing you a formal way of, of illustrating the dilemma. So you need to, to understand this schematic. It's just a matrix two by two matrix, which shows you what the four possibilities are. And I'm introducing notation. And you can obviously look at this at your leisure. This whole slideshow is in your Google Drive folder. So you can download it and look at it. But you're going to need to be mindful of what the notation stands for just in order to process what we're going to do next with the model. So again, you have two prisoners, prisoner one represented here in this column and prisoner two represented in the row above um, and they can either cooperate or defect they each have the same dilemma it's symmetric right because they're both given two choices and the out possible outcomes are obviously four outcomes either they both cooperate they both defect or p1 defects and p2 cooperates or p1 cooperates and p2 defects those are the only four uh, possibilities is a two by two matrix so it has four possible outcomes and the letters stand for the payoffs or utilities now what i mean by utility it's got nothing to do with utilitarianism it's a root word utility means the value to you of a particular outcome that's what utility means in game theory or rational choice theory the utility of an outcome means what is its value to you the value is not necessarily expressed in money uh, the value could be expressed in some other kind of thing like a reward or being released you know without a, an indictment or there could be many ways of expressing value but basically what economists have done and mathematicians have done is they've created an artificial or imaginary unit of value called the utile and some of you who in economics have seen that word utile so a utile pretends to measure the utility so it just converts or maps utility onto numbers so a utility of five would be greater than a utility of one, right? A utility of three would be greater than a utility of zero. The numbers don't necessarily stand for anything in real life. It's not like money, but they just stand for a measure of what is the value of a given outcome to you. Is it, is it clear? It's a way of abstractly attempting to be able to compare the value of different outcomes on some numerical scale. Units of satisfaction, Ramon. Very good. That's another nice way of putting it. A unit of satisfaction, a unit of preference, a unit of value to you, and so forth. That's what we mean by a Utah. Now, in the prisoner's dilemma, and what makes the dilemma a dilemma, is a very particular ordering of the utilities. So that it's always the case, if you change this cardinal uh, inequality, where the there's a specific ordering of the value of the outcomes, then it's no longer a prisoner's dilemma. What makes the dilemma a dilemma is exactly this ordering. So in other words, T is the temptation to defect because if you're a prisoner one, imagine you're prisoner one. So T is the biggest possible payoff to you. This is your best outcome for you. Uh, so you're always gonna be tempted to try and get T because it's better than all the other outcomes. Uh, R is the reward for mutual cooperation. So if you both cooperate, meaning you don't talk, you don't rat against each other, they're both, you're going to get let go, which is a very good thing for both of you. So that's a great outcome. Not as much as T, because if you give evidence against the other prisoner, then supposedly you get, they let you go and they give you a, a month, they give you a reward too. Maybe they give you money uh, or something. So T is bigger than R. 
All right. And then P in this case doesn't mean prisoner. It means in the in the actual payoff structure. It means the punishment for mutual defection, because if you both go for T, you're both going to defect. And if you both defect, then you end up not getting T either of you. You end up getting the worst joint punishment, which is mutual. You're going to give evidence against each other. They got you both. Right. So that's a punishment. And S is the worst payoff of all. This is S means the so-called suckers payoff, which means that you cooperate and your opposite number defects, right? So they get the best payoff, which is T, and you get the worst payoff, which is S, and S is going to be worse than P. So that's the ordering of things. Yeah, it's it's weird. That's right, Ahmed. You can put it that way. It's win-win, win-lose, lose-win, or lose-lose. That's right. But the win-lose and lose-win outcomes are not the same as the win-win or the lose-lose because the win-lose is a bigger win and a, and a bigger loss, right? The win-win is a slightly smaller win for both than the win-lose, and the lose-lose outcome is actually a, a slightly better loss for both than being at the losing end of a, of a win-lose. If that hasn't confused everybody, don't ask me to repeat that, but there's just a feature of the matrix because there's no two cases where any any of these are equal payoffs. So you either both win or you win bigger, but the other one loses bigger in the case of TS or ST, or you both lose. But that's the ordering always. This is the key. This is what defines a prisoner's dilemma, that particular ordering. All right. So, um, well, it's a little premature uh, to, to know what you are going to do, although you may already have decided what you would do. Uh, Ahmed, you, you know, you would take win-win. But, uh, of course, if you choose uh, the, to cooperate, which is a very good thing to do, I think. Uh, on the other hand, just remember, you're exposing yourself to risk because if you cooperate, thinking that your opposite number will cooperate and you'll get the win-win, so-called, there's a more technical name for this, we'll come to it momentarily, you're also running a risk that the other person is going to defect and then you're going to end up with the sucker's payoff. So that's a risk you take when you risk this mutual cooperation outcome. That's why it's a dilemma. And it doesn't already, it doesn't depend on how well you know each other because best friends or even siblings or whoever, when they're separated, you never know what they may be tempted to do. That's, that's the, uh, you see, that's why it is a dilemma. There's no clear answer as to what you, the individual would do, but kind of diabolically, the outcome is not dependent strictly on you. It's, it's, or strictly on the other person. The outcome is always going to be jointly generated by what you both decide. So we're clear. This is why it's a dilemma. All right. Good. So anyway, this you have to know. You want to basically digest the, the representation. So it's very clear to you why it's a dilemma. And I could plug in some numbers. Just again, the numbers are, are just arbitrary utiles, but the numbers respect the same payoff structure. So you could see the, the rule that's imposed on this structure is again, consistent with the uh, ordering, as we call it, of the payoffs, such that in this case, let's say the temptation to cooperate would be, uh, I mean, the temptation to defect would be five and the sucker's payoff would be minus three. Um, so you could see the disparity. Win-win would be three utiles each, but if you defect and the other one cooperates, then you get a bigger payoff. Five is bigger than three. That's your temptation to defect. But minus three, of course, is much worse than three. So that would be the other person's worry about getting the sucker's payoff. In that case, you might both decide to defect to protect yourself against this, but then you're both definitely going to get a bad thing anyway, which is not as bad as the sucker's payoff, but still not good. All right. So that's just plugging in a couple of numbers to illustrate. It's the same thing, just with some numbers that respect, again, this transitive ordering. And that's why the dilemma is a dilemma. Now we're going to go more deeply into the structure to see what informs these choices. So we have tech terminology that's been developed historically to describe the two symmetric outcomes, so-called RR, where both players cooperate. Uh, that's called Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient. You may have heard this in your economics class from these Italian economists and sociologists, Vilfredo Pareto. He's the one who 
came up with this terminology. This is the best outcome for both overall. That's why it's called optimal or Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient. On the other hand, this outcome is the worst for both overall. And it's called the Nash equilibrium after John Nash, the famous American economist who won a Nobel Prize. Uh, you may have heard of John Nash. And uh, there's a movie. Yes, he did. Very sadly, Ahmed, you're well informed. He and his wife died in a car crash in New Jersey. I believe they were in a taxi and they were in a fatal traffic accident not that long ago, Ahmed. And I, I you know, I knew John. I met John Nash once um, and he was um, he, there's a movie about him. Hollywood naturally did a complete and utter distortion. Well, the Hollywood portrayed him as schizophrenic. And that was Hollywood's distortion. The movie, which I recommend to you, if you're interested in his life, or rather in a distorted portrayal of his life, it's a very interesting movie anyway. It's called A Beautiful Mind. And that's the movie about John Nash. So they have him as a kind of schizophrenia who's, yeah, with Russell Crowe, right. So he's a kind of schizophrenia, is kind of schizophrenic who sees mathematical equations everywhere. So he's kind of half insane, but he's actually seeing very deeply into the structure of these kinds of models. Uh, so I mean, this is all fabrication. Uh, he was a very brilliant ec economist, I think, and probably... Uh, not as not as schizophrenic, certainly as Hollywood portrays him. In any case, it's called a Nash equilibrium. Um, if both um, said that the movie bit about him, yeah, it totally false, totally false. I, I mean, we should rule of thumb: never believe anything you see in the movies. If they, if they accidentally tell you something that's true, then it just suited the script. But believe me, they're not out to tell you the truth; they're out to entertain you. So they start with a you know with something that's historically. Uh, a real person, but then they turn it into some kind of fiction or fantasy. Um, so anyway, you're getting the real deal from me uh, because I'm just telling you what he did and not what Hollywood said he did. This is not about his life. It's about his, his, his work. So the Nash equilibrium is called a Nash equilibrium technically because you can't improve by changing your decision if the other person doesn't change theirs. I mean, in other words, if you are prisoner one, you got here because you defected, right? And so did the other prisoner. But if you decided to cooperate instead, you'd have been worse off, right? If you decided, you're prisoner one, if you decided to cooperate and the other player didn't change their decision to defect, then you would have got the sucker's payoff. So you're still better off defecting than cooperating if the other player defects. So the Nash equilibrium is one that no player can really change from without worsening their a payoff provided the other player doesn't change. And it turns out that both of these symmetric states, the RR state and the PP state, are called attractors in the model. And if we play the iterated game with the same pair of people over very, very many iterations. It turns out, and social psychologists have discovered this under a variety of experimental conditions, that they will tend to play alike more and more often. As the game unfolds, The one of these two states is often going to be a state they lock into and remain in, whereas these asymmetric states are states that don't tend to get locked into in the iterated case. So these are attractors of the model, but once again, they don't tell you which one is going to be the, the one you should prefer. That's why it's a dilemma. Obviously, you may prefer RR, but uh, you may get locked into PP to try and protect yourself against the other player's defection. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so it, by iterated, I mean multiple rounds. So they're, they're attractors in the model because in multiple rounds, players will almost always get locked into one of these two states. And that's just how it goes. Um, well, this is a question. Uh, we're not talking about psychology now. We're talking about trying to get the best outcome. But we will look at applications uh, which take in a lot of factors, but based on the decision theory alone, it is going to raise psychological, sociological, economic, and moral questions. But I only want to look at it now as a question of rational choice, all right? So keep that thought, Ahmed, but that's not our immediate concern. You're not necessarily betraying a lifetime friend. The model is generic. It's not saying that P1 and P2 are friends. It's merely saying that there are two people who've been taken into custody. 
oh, you're now Amir is very prescient to say it's an illustration of Hobbes. Yes. And on Thursday, good for you to see that. This is when we're talking about many players. And if you're in a society where everybody's defecting, then Hobbes said exactly, except, you know, he said it 400 years before, 300 years before, that if you're in a state of nature and everyone is defecting basically and out for themselves, then if you cooperate, you're going to be exploited by everybody. So you should be willing. Remember, Hobbes says you should be willing to lay down your right to all things only if other people are too. So we get into a covenant when a majority of people decide to cooperate with each other. But if, if enough people are defecting, then that's not going to happen. And you may end up having to defect also. So I'm glad we're going to look at that connection more deeply on Thursday, but I'm really glad you saw it. And uh, that's right. The state of nature would be the Nash in a multiplayer game. Uh, the state of nature, the Nash equilibrium would indeed correspond to a Hobbesian state of nature. And in, uh, whereas in, uh, again, a multiplayer game, the Pareto optimal outcome would indeed uh, pertain or correspond to a case where most people, or if not everyone, has a, has keep, is keeping their covenants. That's a tremendous thing that you've seen that already. Good for you to have made that connection. But we're still in the two-player case, and we're going to remain there for most of today. Now, I want to go more deeply into the model with you, but I'm really glad some of you are seeing this connection. That's great. Um, that is that 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 your uh, your your picture is big and your taking all this in and connecting it to other things. What makes the dilemma dilemma is our next question. And I'm looking more now at the deep structure rather than the just the question of, you know, do I rat on my friend or not? I'm not talking about the psychological aspects of the dilemma now. I'm talking about the rational choice, theoretic aspects. So I would like to say this is not psychology. This is rational choice theory. And it's looking at it really in, in that domain. So we, 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 just say, we see that there are two conflicting principles of choice. What generates the dilemma are these two conflicting principles. And there's no way to decide which principle is better than the other or more preferable or more appropriate. But each principle is persuasive in its own way. And so that is in a decision theoretic point of view or a rational choice point of view, what really makes it a dilemma is that there are two conflicting principles by which we may decide to cooperate or defect. And I want now to uh, look at these principles with you. One of them is called dominance. And in this model, we happen to have strong dominance. That's when one state of affairs or one choice is, is strongly preferable to another. <clears throat> and do the dominance principle would lead you to defect. It will tell you you're better off defecting no matter what the other player does. And that's true. Uh, unfortunately, if you both defect, you end up here. And the other principle that might lead you to cooperate is called maximizing expected utility. And we're going to look at what that means. That's a principle that comes out of economics, but it, it happens in everyday life. And there are many moral philosophers, including this one, who would assert that most of you actually here today, most of us in general, are in fact utility maximizers. Although we don't formally do the calculus, we don't formally, when we make decisions, we don't formally say, okay, now I'm going to compute my expected utilities and make my choice on the basis of maximizing, you know, my outcome from a given decision. But most of us, I submit to you on a given day, are informally going to do this. We're going to try and figure out when confronted with a choice, what is our expected value of outcome A? What is our expected value of outcome B? And we're going to choose the outcome or go for the outcome, which gives us back the, the, you know, our highest expected value or the outcome that we most prefer or the payoff, to say it in game theory language, the payoff that is greatest. So we want to maximize our payoffs in a given situation. And that's called maximizing expected utility. And they're both very solid principles. The problem is that uh, in the prisoner's dilemma, they're going to conflict. This one's going to prescribe that you defect, and this one's going to prescribe that you cooperate. So that's, again, not going to help us resolve the dilemma, but it helps us bore down deeply into the structure of the dilemma. That's why we're looking at this. And Ahmed says you were just arguing this yesterday. Well, there you go. Um, that we're uh, very often uh, going to revert to being utility maximizers. 
and it depends right love if you want to be cynical or maybe experienced in life you may often realize that what people uh, want from each other is some some payoff people make demands on each other Ahmed don't they I mean in a relationship sometimes is basically you say you love the person but you really want something from them or they say they love you but they really want something from you and uh, they choose you perhaps because they think that what they want is from is going to be best coming from you as opposed to somebody else but they want to maximize their expected utility and this can of course precipitate conflicts in a relationship and it's not psychological it has to do with ex expectation <laughs> And what you expect from the other person and maybe get or don't get so anyway that's a different story um, but th these two principles will guide you unfortunately to making different <laughs> choices because dominance will prescribe defection and maximizing expected utility will prescribe cooperation and then that's why the dilemma is a dilemma so then it's not what do you choose necessarily it's at a deeper level which principle of choice do you find more convincing now let's look at each one to see how they diverge in terms of their prescriptions. So dominance is easier to understand. Uh, again, this is the same matrix representation, nothing's changing. So remember the payoffs and the ordering, I'm always putting that there to remind you of the ordering, right? Temptation to defect, reward for mutual cooperation, punishment for defection, and the suckers payoff, just in case you cooperate and the, and the other one, you know, uh, doesn't so in 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 dominance what happens is as for, this is what happens that for each game state if the payoff of defection is greater than the payoff of cooperation in this case that's what it is defection is prescribed so for example you are looking at this let's say from the point of view of of prisoner one imagine you're prisoner one and you're looking at the payoffs and you're saying to yourself you know what t is bigger than r by definition right and p is bigger than s by definition right that's the definition of the model so if i defect i'm better off no matter what the other player does i'm better off defecting right no matter what the other prisoner chooses i'm better off defecting precisely because if i defect no matter what the other player does i'm going to get a better payoff because t is better than r if they cooperate i get a better payoff and also p is better than s so if they defect, I also get a better payoff. So no matter what the other prisoner does, I'm better off defecting. Does that make sense to you? Of the logic of that choice is clear, is it not? You may not, you may not like where it goes, but is that all? Is that clear to you? That in this model, defection dominates cooperation because you're better off defecting no matter what the other prisoner does. It's it's transparently clear from the definition of the model unfortunately so so you defect and here's the problem unfortunately prisoner two reasons exactly the same way right prisoner two says yeah i'm better off defecting no matter what you choose for the same reasoning applies because the model's symmetric so what happens is you both defect and you both end up in the nash equilibrium that very often happens so if you're just thinking about what's better off for you uh, you're gonna you're gonna end up defecting and then you both, if you, but if you both think that way, then you end up in the Nash equilibrium, all right? Uh, which is obviously not the most desirable payoff, but this is what dominance will do. So you are thinking individually what's best for you, and the other one thinks that way too, and then you end up with a not very good collective payoff. But dominance is still a principle that will certainly uh, impel choices in many cases. If you're in a situation where you're better off doing certain thing, no matter what everybody else does, then you're going to pick that, right? That's that's basically uh, a motivating factor for us. It's a dominant strategy or dominant choice. So now you understand from that perspective how both players get into that position. Now let's look at the other one, which is maximizing expected utility. And this is a little more complicated to write out, but I'm going to explain it to you and I'm going to show you a model a very simple model I will illustrate it. To maximize your expected utility, you have to figure out what is the best expected value of a certain choice. In other words, the expected value of cooperation, there's gonna be a calculation that will tell me what the expected value is, no matter what the other player does. And there's an expected value of defection and a calculation that tells me what the expected value is, no matter what the other player does. And the simplest way to compute your expected utility of a choice 
is it's a sum of products. You have to take the probability of this outcome for you times its value plus the probability of this outcome for you times its value. That sum of products will be the expected utility of cooperation. And similarly, you would have to compute the sum of the products of the other choice, the probability of this outcome times its value to you, plus the probability of this outcome times its value to you. And that sum of products would be your expected utility of defection. And then once you know what the expected utility of cooperation is, and you also know, because you've computed them, what the expected utility of defection is, you take which one is bigger. You maximize, in other words, meaning I take the larger of the two. So if I know the expected utility of cooperation, and I know the expected utility of defection to me, right, what is the expected value? I just pick whichever is the larger, and that will be my choice. So how do you actually compute them? We can do a simple, very simple computation by making one assumption. It's totally permissible to make. And that is that it's more probable that the two players will play the same. In other words, it's more probable that they will either both cooperate or both defect than that one will cooperate and the other will defect. So if these symmetric states are more probable, we can push that assumption to the max and we can assume complete probabilistic dependence, okay? Assume complete probabilistic dependence. It means we assume that the probability uh, that if you cooperate, the other player does, we'll assume that probability is one, okay? Just assume it for a second. And that means that the probability that if you cooperate, the other player defects must be zero because the probability of this plus the probability of this must equal one, sorry. I shouldn't be clicking all these things. The probability of that plus the probability of that must equal unity. So if we assume the probability of this is one, then the probability of this is zero. In other words, we're assuming with that if you cooperate, the other player cooperates, the probability of that is one. If that's the case, that really simplifies things and also for defection. It means your expected utility of cooperation, which is always going to be the probability of this times the value R, plus the probability of this times the value S to you, right, is going to be simply R. Because if this is one and this is zero, then this thing becomes one times R, which is R, and this thing becomes zero, so it falls out of the equation. And that means your expected utility of cooperation is R, right? That's for you, the value of cooperation based on this assumption. Similarly, if we assume complete probabilistic dependence, it means that the probability of this thing, if you defect, the probability of the other player defecting is one. And if you defect, the probability of the other player cooperating is zero. We're making that assumption again. So once again, this thing will become zero and this thing will become one. So because of our assumption, so the expected utility of defection will be one times P, which is P, all right? And the expected utility of this thing will become zero because that's zero. So the expected utility defection is P. And the expected utility cooperation is R. That's really simplified the math, right? So that means if your expected utility of cooperation is R and your expected utility of defection is P, since R is greater than P, you want to maximize your expected utility, right? So you choose cooperation because the expected outcome, the expected value of cooperation for you is gonna be higher, namely R, than the expected utility or value of defection, which is only P. So you would choose to cooperate. The calculus of maximizing your expected utility would indeed prescribe cooperation. And if the other player applies that principle, they're gonna arrive at exactly the same conclusion as you, and therefore they're gonna to cooperate too. And if both people maximize their expected utility, then in fact, you're both going to achieve the Pareto optimal outcome. You see, so defection and the dominance principle, which defection prescribes, leads both players, if they adopt it, to the Nash equilibrium. Whereas cooperation, which is prescribed by maximizing expected utility, leads you both to the Pareto optimal outcome, which is obviously a better outcome for both of you. So that's a deeper analysis of why 
the dilemma is a dilemma, it becomes a question of two conflicting principles of choice. And if some of you are confused about maximizing expected utility, I'll show you a simpler thing that hopefully will clear it up for you because you all know this intuitively. I've said this before. And I'm gonna give you two quick illustrations of how it works in a much simpler way. Then you can go back and study the model. Just let me share a much simpler screen with you. And it has to do with uh, this thing, which is a coin toss. And I'm gonna share with you this very, very simple illustration. Now I'll bet you, I'm willing to bet, that most of you don't waste your time betting on the toss of a coin, unless you're totally bored and you have nothing to lose but money. Um, but basically you're not gonna lose money if it's a fair coin. Because in the long run, if it's a fair coin, by definition, you know that the probability of heads is what? If it's a fair coin, what's the probability of heads? Anybody? Yes, that's right. The probability of heads. 50, 50, that's right, 50, David, 0.5. It can't be one, Lenise. The pro a half is correct, yes. So if it's a fair coin, the probability of heads is a half and the probability of tails is a half. So that's why most people don't waste their time playing this game because they know that, like say you bet $10, right? If, if you keep doing it over the long run, you're gonna break even, aren't you? Right, over many, many, many games. If the coin is fair, you're going to end up getting heads half the time and tails half the time. So half the time, you're going to win $10 and half the time, you're going to lose $10. So at the end of the day, you're going to come out very close to even, correct? Doesn't your intuition tell you this? Hopefully your intuition tells you this. And if you do the calculation, this is exactly what maximizing expected utilities will tell you. The expected utility of betting heads is just the probability We'll say the bet is $10. So the payoff is either 10 if you win or minus 10 if you lose. So, so in this case, the expected utility of betting heads is just the probability that if you bet heads, heads comes up times the value, which is $10, plus the probability that if you bet heads, tails comes up times the value, which is minus $10. Again, it's a sum of products. And since we know that a fair coin has probability half of coming up on either case, then the expected utility of heads is simply a half of 10 plus a half of minus 10, which is five minus five, which is zero. So that's why there's no advantage to betting heads or tails. If it's a fair coin, you know this already. Now tell me, please, please <laughs> tell me you understood this without the math that you know if it's a fair coin that there's no advantage to betting heads or tails. Is that right? You already knew this. Yes. Good. At least one person knew this. Why? Because intuitively you understand how this works without even doing, you've probably never done this math, but you still knew that there's no advantage in betting heads or, or betting tails if it's a fair coin. So you knew this. Whereas let's say now, let's change the model. Let's say you watch this game being played by other people and they're tossing a coin over and over again. They're taking turns. And you notice something because you're keeping track of the outcomes. Let's say you notice as heads is coming up 60% of the time and tails is coming up 40% of the time. So that tells you what? If you see heads 60% over a very large number of trials, you see heads coming up 60% and tails coming up 40% of the time, you may well suspect with very good reason that this is not a fair coin. This coin is somehow weighted right? It's like loaded dice, like it's not fair. So heads is coming up much more often than tails, which in probability 60% over 40% would be a very statistically significant difference over a large number of trials. So you would then bet what? If you took, if you had observed this, then what are you going to bet on heads or tails? Obviously, of course you all, because you all intuitively know, and none of you have done the math yet. Now, you don't have to do the math because I'm saying what some moral philosophers are saying and what Thomas Hobbes said, that you're all instinctively born. All of us are born utility maximizers. We're always trying to get the outcome which satisfies our self-interest. And if you see this coin is weighted to give more probability of heads and tails, you're going to bet on heads because you're self-interested and you want to win the bet. Of course you do. But if you do the math, you'll see why also. Now I'm asking you to do 
what I did in the prisoner's dilemma, and it's not complicated. If we decide arbitrarily that the coin is unfair and that the probability of heads is now 60%, and the probability of tails is now 40%, then we see obviously the utility of betting heads, the expected utility of heads is going to be not a half times 10, but it's going to be 0.6 times 10, right? And the utility of betting tails is only going to be 0.4 times minus 10, right? So 0.6, you can do the math, 0.6 times 10 is $6, not five. And 0.4 times minus 10 is minus $4 not five, right? So your expected utility of heads is going to be six minus four, that's plus $2. So if the coin is weighted such that it's probabilistically going to come up head 60% of the time, tails 40% of the time, your expected utility of betting heads is going to be, you're going to average $2 every time over a long number of trials, you're going to average $2 per trial in your pocket. And so you're going to, your expected utility of heads is two dollars that's positive you're going to bet heads whereas if you do the symmetric and do it for homework do it a you know as an exercise you will find on the same assumption that the expected utility of betting tails is going to lose you two dollars average per trial so over a long number of trials you're going to lose two dollars average each time you play so obviously you're going to bet heads okay that's because we know that your utility maximizers and you don't even need to do the calculation to do an intuitive form of utility calculation. You just do it without the math. Is that, is that fair enough? Okay, so Achman's already done the homework, exactly. That's, that's in the case where, um, uh, yeah, okay, fine. That's, that's in the case where you're betting tails, Ahmed. In the case where you're betting heads and the coin is weighted, then you know that you're gonna gain $2 per toss on average. So <clears throat> is this clear to everyone in a, in a straightforward game? All right. The prisoner's dilemma, of course, is not that straightforward because we don't really know what the probabilities are. And we also, um, unless we play a large number of cases, but also we don't see symmetric payoffs like this. The payoffs are asymmetric. So it's more complicated. I'll give you one more illustration just to just to make this really clear to you. Do you remember the example? We were talking about this with respect to integrity, a totally different topic. We were talking about in, in, in or context of moral philosophy. Um, we were talking about the cop who found uh, $60,000 in drug money in, a, in the car. You remember the cop who found $60,000 in drug money and he could have pocketed the money, but he decided to turn it in. Do you remember that, that case we were discussing? Yeah, okay. Oh, you all remember that. Okay. And remember his reasoning for turning it in? It wasn't because he was doing the honest thing. He said, well, I didn't want to risk my pension. Remember that? He said, well, my pension is, you know, could be worth like $2 million. It's not worth risking my pension for 60000 Of course. So that was also a calculation where he was maximizing his expected utility, right? He was saying the utility of pocketing this money is a certain gain of 60000 but I have to weigh that against the probability of losing my whole pension if I get caught. And obviously that's not worth it because the utility of being guaranteed a much bigger sum in the long run is going to be much higher. The value to me of, of being guaranteed a much larger sum of money in the long run is much larger expected value than that of you know cashing in a small amount of money in the short run and risking the really large amount. And Ahmed says, you turn it in for the same reason. Well, again, Hobbes would say, although not in the same language, uh, but in, you know, he would say you're a, you're a utility maximizer, um, that you're doing what's best for you. You're doing the thing that you think produces the best result for you. That's called utility maximization. And one of you said before, I'll just scroll back. One of you said, so in this case, when he said, in this case, we're directing reactions to what gives us the best consequence. That's right. That's what we're doing. We're trying to get the best outcome for ourselves. It's exactly right. We're, we're almost always trying to do that, says Hobbes. And, and in, in this model, we're also saying, well, it is psychologically, Taisha, now you're back to psychology, delayed gratification. Yes, now you might want to argue if you're a psychologist that, that you know, pe some people are better at delaying gratification than others for whatever reasons. Yeah, some people experimentally will show 
that they're uh, able, right, experimentally in certain situations to defer gratification. We call it deferment, really, not delaying, but either way, whereas other people are more impulsive, perhaps, by nature, so they'll tend to take what they can get immediately, and there may be uh, some kind of psychology that informs this. But again, I'm just talking about the decision principle. Um, and your expected uh, payoff in the prisoner's dilemma is not the case of the pension, because in the prisoner's dilemma, it's instantaneous. Remember, you're going to make a choice whether to give evidence or not against the other prisoner. The other prisoner is going to make a choice whether to give evidence or not against you. It's not going to take 20 years for the outcome to happen. It's going to take a few minutes or at most a few hours for you to figure out what the other prisoner did. Uh, in terms of, you know, the joint decision that you've made in separation. So there's, it's not so much delayed gratification in this model. That's not really applicable. But I'm just showing you in a more general way that regardless of the temporal uh, distension of the model, it doesn't matter how long it takes to play out in time, that most of us, a lot of the time, are interested in the best outcome that we can get. And that's called expected utility maximization. We're utility maximizers. And so, uh, okay, uh, I just wanted to illustrate that. Now let's come back to the model. I think that you're, a lot of you seem to be getting this and I'm really happy and you don't, I hope you understand, you don't need to do the math. Um, it's really helpful if you can understand that concept and think about it. But as long as you understand that what the math is representing is utility maximization and that you get the idea of what utility maximization means, you'll understand why people would choose to cooperate because if they think they're going to get the best outcome from it, which is, in fact, the Pareto optimal one. I'm going to complicate things a little more for you. It's only high school algebra. Don't be afraid of it. But I want to show you an interesting result. You're not responsible for the math. If you can understand it, that's fine. But in fact, we don't need, as it turns out, we don't even need to assume that this probability is one and this is zero, as we did before. And similarly, that this probability is one and this is zero. That was an assumption of complete probabilistic dependence, that assuming they're going to play alike with probability one, and that they're going to play differently with probability zero. We don't even need that assumption. We can weaken that assumption and still get a prescription of cooperation. Amazingly enough, in this model, we can just assume that the probability that they're going to play the same as x, and therefore the probability that they play differently is one minus x. And then we can do a little bit of algebra <laughs> And if you do that algebra at home, you will still see something really interesting, that for this principle to prescribe cooperation, we need to satisfy this inequality. And it turns out that this inequality is satisfied exactly when x is greater than a half. And if x is greater than a half, then the expected utility calculation will prescribe that you cooperate and not defect your utility cooperation will be greater than defection. If X is greater than a half, meaning in plain English, if you think that the other prisoner is going to cooperate with greater than a 50-50 chance, it could be just a little greater, doesn't matter, anything greater than 50-50, then expected utility of cooperation will be greater than that of defection for you. And that's a condition of the model. No matter what T or P and S explicitly are, this is a universal result. So it's really interesting. If you think the chances, in other words, you still don't need the math, you just need to understand conceptually. If you think the chances that the other person are gonna, is gonna cooperate are greater than 50-50, then you should cooperate too, because that will give you the Pareto optimal outcome, both of you. So you don't even have to be sure that the other person is gonna cooperate. You just think there's a better than 50-50 chance. On the other hand, if you think that there's a less than 50-50 chance, right, the odds of the other person cooperating you think are less than 50-50, then in fact, you're gonna get convergence because maximizing expected utility will tell you you're better off defecting. If you think they're more likely to defect, then you have to defect, why? To protect yourself from getting the sucker's payoff, right? If you think that they're gonna defect with a substantial probability, then you have to defect to protect yourself. Otherwise you'll get the sucker's payoff. So in that case, you, both dominance reasoning and expected utility reasoning will converge. But otherwise, just in case you both think that the other prisoner is going to cooperate with a better than 50-50 chance, then definitely maximizing expected utility 
will prescribe that you cooperate. So we have the dilemma. We haven't solved the dilemma because we haven't said which principle you should adopt. But I hope it's clear. And my ambition here, uh, the intention here is just to illustrate for you in a formal sense uh, why it is that we have a dilemma. And this is a, a deeper analysis. This is the deeper structure of the model. Is this clear to you? And this has got nothing to do with, with psychology, but it has to do purely with rational choice theory. Is that all right? Somehow I've lost the chat room, so I can't see. Um, but are you okay with that? Yes, Professor. Yes? Okay, thank you very much for the confirmation. All right, let's move on. So now we reach a really interesting juncture. We can now summarize this result that we've derived. And we see something really interesting we haven't yet encountered in this course. Namely, that we now are confronted with two very different conceptions of what it means to be rational. And this is interesting food for thought. And this will feed back to economics, to psychology, to anything you want it to feed back to. But it begins really with a philosophical observation. Is it not the case that in the whole course so far, when we discussed either rationalist epistemology or we've discussed rational, the, the, the property of, of being rational and so forth, in terms of the Greek conception of the soul, like the rational part of the soul. We've talked about rationality always in an individual context. Isn't it so? Like a person is rational or not. Yeah. Or a person, is, a person may be rational a lot of the time and irrational at other times. We talked about rationality as a property of an individual. But this model teaches us something very different now and very significant, I believe. It teaches us that actually mutual cooperation is collectively rational because it's the best outcome for both players. Whereas the Nash equilibrium is individually rational because remember you would be choosing the dominance principle on the basis that no matter what the other player does, you're better off defecting and the other player reasons the same way individually, no matter what the other player does, I'm better off defecting. So you do what's individually rational, you end up in actually not such a good situation. Whereas if you do what's collectively rational, you end up in a much better situation. So isn't that interesting? I mean, I think it's interesting that we have now two different ways of thinking about what it means to be rational. We could be individually rational. And that means we end up in not such a good place, sometimes, certainly in this model, or we could be collectively rational, in which case we end up in a much better place in this model. And again, uh, those of you who immediately saw the connection to Hobbes, good for you, because that's really what Hobbes is saying, right? If we're totally self-interested all the time, we're going to end up in a state of nature, a war of all against all. If we pay no attention to anybody, we're just interested in ourselves, we are in conflict. But if we're willing to give up some of our <laughs> liberties to do whatever we want to do, that natural right of all to do whatever they want to do, that's how we get out of the state of nature and into a civil society by being collectively rational. So you could put that into contemporary game theoretic terms and you would end up seeing the value of it. And that distinction in the social contract arguably can only emerge when people are collectively rational. So that's a, an interesting thing, I think, to conceive of rationality in these two different ways, what's individually rational and what's collectively rational. And notice something else that it's sometimes the case that we're not harmed by the irrationality of another person. This is really important. It's important in economics, it's important in psychology, important in sociology, important in politics, it's important in everything that humans do. That is to say, in some small number of cases, if your fellow player or fellow prisoner or opponent or competitor, whoever it is, or partner, whoever it is, is irrational, it may, it may not hurt you at all. I'm thinking about the game of chess. I know many of you play chess. Now, in chess, that's a requirement of chess is that you be very rational, is it not? And you, you have to think very rationally. And if your opponent is irrational, you, it's probably going to help you win. Is that not right? If you're playing chess with an irrational person, wouldn't you say you have a better chance of winning? Anybody? Is it the case? Obviously, you say easily. Yes. All right. Sure. 
Of course, of course, it stands to reason. If your opponent's not rational, it's good for you, right? But now let's suppose we're doing something different. Now suppose we're, uh, we're driving. Suppose we're driving in traffic. You know, we're trying to get somewhere in our car and there's a lot of traffic on the road. If other people behind the wheel are driving irrationally, is that dangerous for you? Absolutely and totally, Valerie, absolutely. So in a situation like driving in traffic, which is a different kind of game, if you want to model it that way, then uh, the irrationality of another player can be harmful to you. In a smaller and limited number of cases, like chess or checkers or maybe poker, but maybe not if they're bluffing, you don't know. But in a small number of cases, the irrationality of another player is not going to harm you and may in fact help you. But in many cases, in social cases, certainly economic cases, political cases, the irrationality of another player can certainly harm you. And the prison's dilemma is that kind of a game where what happens is not just a function of our decision. It's a function of what the other player or in a many player game, the, what the other players do. So that's worth considering. And that's another consequence or caveat when we're thinking about a distinction between individual rationality versus collective rationality. We think about the flip side, collective irrationality could be very bad for the individual. And individual irrationality could end up having deleterious consequences on the collective too. So you begin to see the richness of this game. In the last few minutes today, I want to show you some of the applications of the two-player game. And again, next day, for those who came in late, I will record a lecture Thursday. I know it's Thanksgiving, and I wish you all a happy one. I'm going to record a lecture on Thursday at 11. You're welcome to join me on Blackboard, those in my uh, breakout group, Section M. Those of you who are on holiday, take it, enjoy it. Cook your turkey, do whatever you're going to do. I'll record the lecture Thursday, even if no one's in the room because it's important that we finish this topic this week and I'll upload it to YouTube. And so you should watch it at some point after Thanksgiving, but before next week, just so you'll get the second half. Really important, okay? Please do so. Uh, in other words, cooperate <laughs> and watch the, in this case, watch the second half. All right, let me share the screen with you again. And I'm gonna show you some very basic applications of the two player case which I think are, are obvious. We've talked about all the richness the model has. Here's a very simple and very compelling application. It was the Cold War arms race. We had the USA versus the USSR at the time. Those were the two superpowers. And some of you don't remember this. I do because I lived during it. I remember this crisis. It was a terrible thing when we were on the brink of nuclear war between USA and USSR. You probably read about it in your history classes. I lived through it. Not fun. And it was a prisoner's dilemma, classic prisoner's dilemma. Look at, the, look at the model. Obviously, everyone's better off if both disarm. I don't have to, certainly I don't have to argue that with you. I'm sure you, you agree that we would be better off and, and are better off if we have mutual disarmament. Why? Because there's less of a threat of annihilation, less of a threat of catastrophic nuclear war, and all the money spent on nuclear armaments could more beneficially be spent on health, education, welfare, many other kinds of projects to improve society. Correct? Agreed? So disarmament would have been desirable and indeed was the Pareto optimal state. But what really happened was not that. Instead, immediately after World War II, they got locked into the Nash equilibrium. They started to arm. They were arming like crazy because they were mistrustful that they needed, they needed to have enough nukes to deter an attack. It's, it was insane logic. It's the logic of deterrence, mutual assured destruction. The only way they could assure themselves of not being attacked was to have enough nukes to ensure a, a, a retaliation. Even if they were wiped out, their nukes would still survive long enough to retaliate so both players would be wiped out. So the, the only way to do that was to arm yourself. And what was difficult about moving from the Nash equilibrium where they were stuck for, for years of increasing armament, everybody wanted to disarm and get to this state, but how do you get there? You can't disarm unilaterally because if one player disarms and the other doesn't, they might get the sucker's payoff, right? If the USA had said, okay, we're gonna just disarm, then what if the Soviet Union launched? We wouldn't be able to retaliate. We would, got, we would have gotten the sucker's payoff. Whereas the same thing with the Soviet Union, they said, but if we disarm unilaterally, and the U.S. doesn't, 
then there's nothing to stop them from launching and we'll get the suckers pay off. So you see, it was a prisoner's dilemma, the most dire situation arguably ever facing humanity while it lasted was exactly a prisoner's dilemma on a colossal scale. And eventually they did start agreeing on arms limitation treaties. There's still nuclear weapons out there. This is not over and it's more diffused. You have more players in the game. So the threat is still there, but hopefully it's not as dire as it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But you get that this is a prisoner's dilemma. I hope you see that. That's, that's one of the big applications in political science and why it was so difficult to move from a mutual armed state to a mutually disarmed state. Very difficult. Uh, in evolutionary game theory, it turns out to have applications too, where animals will adopt sharing strategies or monopolization strategies. These aren't literally doves and hawks, but the hawk strategy is to try and monopolize a resource. And if both animals try and monopolize a resource, they may end up fighting over it and injuring each other. Whereas if they share the resource, then they're not going to injure each other in order to both benefit from it. And one may back off and leave it to the other one. All right. If the other one's intimidated, they'll, they'll just not get the resource at all and be hungry. The other one will get all of it. And if, similarly, if the hawk meets the dove, in this case, the hawk may get the whole resource and the dove may just abdicate and say, I don't want to fight, so I'll give it all to you. But then the dove doesn't eat, presumably. And so you could see uh, that this has evolutionary game theory applications, which John Maynard Smith, the British biologist, discovered only in the 1980s. And those of you interested in, in biology, evolutionary biology, should look at evolutionary game theory. So that basically takes me today to the end of what I wanted to cover with you. Uh, and what we're going to do next day, because I will record a lecture Thursday, uh, and I hope you'll have a chance to watch it. We're going to look at a much more evolved set of cases where we go to the end person, where you have many players, not one player. And it gets really interesting in terms of economics and uh, socioeconomics and crime and different kinds of social situations. When you imagine prisoner's dilemma played in a given society, and there are many, many scenarios. Also, it has extremely important implications for the environment. Uh, if everybody pollutes, then we have a big problem. If everybody emits carbon dioxide, we have a big problem. So you see, there's also, unfortunately, the whole problem of climate change and global warming, insofar as humans are contributing to it, also becomes a, a very big prisoner's dilemma. So we'll look at those applications next day. Uh, mutually assured destruction, that's what it was called, Amir. MAD, M-A-D. The initials were MAD because it was insane. But it was. It was. It was the only way to, ironically, the only way to deter a nuclear war was to be sure that you had enough nuclear weapons to convince the other person that they shouldn't launch theirs. So it was mutually assured destruction. It was a prisoner's dilemma. That was the Pareto, uh, the, that was the, excuse me, the Nash equilibrium when everybody was armed to the teeth. And how did you get to a you know, disarmed state? That was the question. How do you get mutual disarmament out of it? How do you get both, both superpowers to cooperate? Not so easy. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground this morning. I just want to wish you all at this point a very happy Thanksgiving and I hope you have a good holiday and a good break. We will resume next week with a spinoff and our last topic on the agenda, which is a spinoff of the prisoner's dilemma called Newcomb's Problem, which is a very fascinating game that we'll play. But uh, my next lecture Thursday, which will be uploaded, is going to be the second half of the prisoner's dilemma where we look at some really interesting consequences of many, many players in different situations and see how that evolves. So that's our mission, half accomplished today. Have a happy holiday, everybody. And you're more than welcome, everyone. Thanks for your participation this morning. Please make sure you understand what we looked at today so you'll be well prepared to appreciate the end person case, which is quite, I think, quite interesting for you and for me too. All right. I will see you later. Have a wonderful holiday. Have a safe week and be well. Bye for now.